Good afternoon and welcome to the ICIT Cyber Legislation and Federal Initiatives webcast. My name is Drew Spaniel and I'm the lead researcher for ICIT. If you're unfamiliar with ICIT or if this is your first time joining us, ICIT is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, uh, vendor agnostic think tank whose mission is to cultivate a cybersecurity renaissance that will improve the resiliency of our nation's 16 critical infrastructure sectors, defend our democratic institutions, and empower generations of cybersecurity leaders. You can engage with ICIT at our in person and virtual events via our newsletter on social networks such as LinkedIn and on our website, www.icitech.org. ICIT individual members will receive two analyst reports alongside this briefing. Those documents will have all of the updates that are discussed today in greater depth, along with links relevant to both the pieces of legislation and the agency initiatives that will be discussed today. If you would like to join ICIT as an individual member, the cost is relatively cheap, and I believe that you get a great return on value. Uh, please email members at ICITECH.org or go to our website to join. Here are some examples of what the write-ups look like in the printed document that comes to individual members with this briefing. Jumping in this month, we have 52 agency initiatives to cover and uh, 19 uh, pieces of legislation. So I am going to try to move through these as expediently as possible uh, with respect to everyone's time. If you would like greater depth on anything discussed today, please sign up for the individual memberships, or if you are an individual member, please consult the reports. Jumping right in with the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, urging states to write stricter credit reporting laws. The CFPB reminds states that they can enact tougher credit reporting laws according to preemption provisions of the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act. These custom laws could be stricter and more flexible than the FCRA laws and may better shield consumers from the impacts of digital data theft, identity theft, and digital financial attacks. The CFPB is also asserting its authority to regulate financial tech companies and seeks comment on process transparency. They announced that they will be plan to invoke a largely unused provision to examine non-bank financial companies that pose risks to consumers. Uh, they believe these entities are, believe they, the CFPB believes that utilizing this dormant authority will help protect consumers and level the playing field between banks and non-banks. They are seeking public comment on procedural rules to make the process more transparent. This authority comes under the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010, which allows CFPB the authority to use traditional law enforcement to stop companies from engaging in conduct that pose risk to consumers. CFPB is also increasing the scrutiny on how companies are using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, you'll see that theme actually pop up a few times today. Um, financial institutions and te financial technology companies are increasingly using AI and machine learning to offer and deliver pro uh, products and services to consumers, but the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau uh, is concerned about the scope and utilization of that data and how those AI algorithms are being responsibly developed and applied. In the request for information, the CFPB and other federal financial institution regulators express support for responsible innovation that identifies and manages risks associated to the use of the new technologies, such as AI and machine learning. Through the RFI and other regulatory and advisory efforts, the regulators gathered substantial information on purpose, governance, risk management, and controls that financial entities can use uh, to, to adopt AI responsibly, and also the challenges faced on developing such entities 
as well as adopting and managing the artificial intelligence and machine learning platforms. Moving on to the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, SISA issued an advisory on the Pwn Kit Linux vulnerability. They added an advisory uh, about the security vulnerability known as Pwn Kit, which affects uh, Linux to their catalog and warns that the flaws is act actively being exploited in attacks. The bug, which is tracked as CVE 2021-4034, was discovered by Qualys researchers in January of 2022 and exists in the PK exec component of the Pull Kit system utility, which is used in all major Linux distributions, including Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, and Fedora. All federal agencies that fall under the federal civilian executive branch are required to secure their systems against the bug by July 18th of this year. So um, about a little over two weeks from the time of this briefing. SISA has released guidance on switching from basic authentication in Microsoft Exchange to modern authentication before Microsoft permanently disables the basic authentication version on October 1st. Basic authentication is a legacy authentication method. This does not support multi-factor authentication, which is a requirement for federal civilian executive branch agencies per executive order 14.028, improving the nation's cybersecurity. SISA has released its Cloud Security Technical Reference Architecture 2.0 guidance for agencies looking to secure, securely migrate to the cloud, including planning considerations for cloud security posture management and shared services. The latest version of the document incorporates learnings from more than 300 public comments the agencies received in September and implemented together with the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program, U.S. Digital Service and Office and the Office of Management and Budget. In a House Homeland Security hearing on June 28th, Matt Hartman, Hartman Deputy Assist Executive Assistant Director for SISA, reiterated to lawmakers that the agency was looking for a 24-month timeline to develop specific regulations for the reporting regime and laid out a number of questions officials were grappling with to determine the scope of implementing breach reporting rules. So in summary, that is a uh, assumed two-year timeline for SISA to implement breach reporting rules. SISA and the U.S. Coast Guard are releasing the Joint Cybersecurity Advisory to warn network defenders that threat actors, including state-sponsored uh, pers advanced persistent threats, or ABTs, are continuing to exploit CVE 2021-44-28-22-8, which is better known uh, by Log4Shell, which I assume most of the audience is familiar with at this point. Um, this vulnerability predominantly affects VMware Horizon and United unified access gateway servers to obtain initial access to organizations that did not apply available patches or workarounds. Since December of last year, multiple threat actors have exploited log for shell on unpatched public-facing VMware Horizon and UAG servers as part of the exploitation. Threat actors implement loaded loader malware on compromised systems with embedded exec executables, enabling remote command and control. SISA and the Coast Guard recommend all organizations with affected systems that did not immediately apply patches or workarounds to assume themselves compromised and initiate threat hunting activities using the IOCs provided in the advisory. If potential compromise is detected, administrators should apply the incident response recommendations, uh, which are also included in the advisory. The 2022 CWE Top 25 Most Dangerous Software Weakness Lists uh, has been released. This is a collaboration between SISA and MITRE. 
The list contains the most common and impactful weaknesses seen last year and is based on analysis of over 38,000 CVE records. Some highlights are that out of bound write and cross scripting, cross site scripting remain two of the most dangerous vulnerabilities. While some other um, significant changes include race conditions moving from number 33 to 22, code injection moving from 28 to 25 on the list, uncontrolled resource consumption from 27 to 23. Uh, there are also some new vulnerabilities. Uh, Three vulnerabilities were removed from the 2021 list, uh, which were exposure of sensitive information to unauthorized actors, insufficiently protected credentials, and incorrect permission assignment for critical resources. We've included a table of the top 25 vulnerabilities in the individual members report, and we also encourage you to take a look at the MITRE report. SISA has issued a security advisory to the health care and public health sector, warning of three high severity vulnerabilities in the Office DCMTK software. The software is used for examining, constructing, and converting DICOM image files, handling offline media, and sending and receiving images over a network connection. The vulnerabilities affect all versions of the DCMTK prior to version 3.6.7. If exploited, a remote attacker could trigger a denial of service condition, write malformed DICOM files into arbitrary directories, and gain remote code execution. You can read more about these three vulnerabilities in greater depth in the write-up or at, in the SISA advisory. SISA, the NSA, the New Zealand National Cybersecurity Center, and the United Kingdom National Cybersecurity Center have published an advisory to uh, properly configure PowerShell. They urge individuals not to remove PowerShell, uh, which is the built-in command line tool for Windows, but to instead properly configure it. Um, they go through the, in, in, in the advisory, they go through the reasoning on why it is more effective and more secure to properly uh, harden the security around it instead of removing it. Um, but they also note the extensibility, ease of use and availability um, of the tool, but that can, and, and also denote how that can be leveraged by malicious actors. The Turning the Corner on Cyber Hygiene subcommittee uh, under SISA recommends that it launch a 311 call line, which would be designated to provide assistance for small medium businesses that have experienced a cybersecurity incident. The proposal came from George Stephanopoulos, uh, Apple's Vice President of Corporate Information Security, who also sits on the committee. The call line would also offer immediate training and services for small and medium businesses uh, due to their limited resources, and it could pave the way for federal authorities to, to track incidents. SISA plans to host its 2022 Chemical Security Summit virtually and in person from August 23rd to 25th in the National Capital Region. The summit, which is free to attend and open to the public, is expected to include participants from across the spectrum of sectors that deal with the chemical security. Uh, these include chemical, energy, communications, transportation, water, uh, the agenda, plan, and, and will address recent programs and regulatory updates, share perspectives and lessons learned, and engage in dialogue regarding chemical security. Chemical and related industry stakeholders, corporate and facility security offers, environment 
health and safety professionals are encouraged to attend. Sessions will discuss and share the latest in chemical security best practices, including the state of the sector, uh, reflecting on the 15 years under the CFATS, case studies from industry representatives, cyber incident response, a deep dive into the CFATS risk-based performance standards and best practices, chemical and engine emerging threat briefings, and cyber hygiene resources. Registration is expected to open soon, so please keep an eye on SISE's website for that. Uh, as a footnote here, um, ICIT and our wonderful community of contributors also have a book coming out uh, entitled Securing the Nation's Critical Infrastructures, a guide for the 2021 to 2025 administration, which also does address um, each sector, including the chemical sector. Uh, so please keep an eye on that in the coming months or for updates on that. SISA has issued multiple advisories for the JTEKT software uh, that is leveraged in the I, in ICS environments. Three Phoenix contact devices and a Siemen product are also included in the advisories being vulnerable to these threats. Um, additionally, uh, and maybe more relevant or, or more um, notable to our audience, I'm sure many of you have heard, have seen the um, icefall research that came out of Forescout. Um, the advisory also touches on the 56 common software flaws and vulnerabilities in OT equipment that were discussed in that report. If you have not seen the OT icefall research, uh, please take a look. Uh, and if you operate any of these systems or work with organizations who operate any of these ICS and OT systems, please definitely um, read the advisory, read the report, and do what you need to do to secure your environment. Uh, affected vendors include uh, Baker Hughes, Immerse, Emerson, Honeywell, JTEKT, Motorola, Omron, Phoenix Connect, Siemens, and Yokogawa. There's an additional vendor who I believe has not been publicly disclosed as well. The Transforming the Cyber Workforce Subcommittee under SISA, uh, which is led by MasterCard's Chief Security Officer Ron Green, recommended that the agency conduct a comprehensive review of its current workforce and talent needs to ensure it's properly aligned with the agency's strategic goals and future growth. Uh, it's also urging SISA to cut in half the amount of time it takes to onboard applicants and expand the agency's recruiting effort to a wider swath of potential candidates. The Protecting Critical Infrastructure for Misinformation and Disinformation Subcommittee uh, advised SISA on over 100 critical infrastructure and election security recommendations on topics ranging from combating disinformation to reducing critical infrastructure risks. Um, some of these recommendations include developing incentives and access to information to aid security research who will submit vulnerabilities affecting critical systems. And some sub recommendations include things like encouraging continued participation by providing rewards such as public recognition and cash rewards. Um, some recommendations are immediate while others um, are, are more in the long term. SISA is aiming to issue the second version of its Zero Trust Maturity Model this summer. The first version of the model, which received over 300 comments from the community, um, was released late last year and are being worked into the new draft with the goal of making it an enduring living document. SISA is also developing a guide to help agencies overcome the challenges of managing sub cyber supply chain risks. 
they recently ran a program, a pilot program designed to figure out all of the measures required to stand up and sustain a CSC RIM program within federal departments and agencies. And they recently developed the overview and guidelines document, which combines learnings from NIST 161 and elements of NIST 853 Rev 5 and other resources. SISA, DHS, and DOD recently released their 5G security evaluation process, which is a proposed five-step 5G security evaluation process designed to help agencies looking to adopt 5G technologies conduct the preparation for NIST, the NIST risk management framework for system authorization. The guidance was drafted in coordination with DHS's Science and Technology Directorate and the DOD's Office of the Undersecretary of Defense and Research and Engineering. A uh, summary of the steps includes establishing a use case definition to identify 5G subsystems that are part of the system component configurations, applications, and interfaces involved in the operations of the system, defining the boundaries to identify the technologies and systems, requiring assessment and authorization, taking into consideration the ownership and deployment of the products and services that comprise that use case, requiring a high-level threat analysis of each 5G subsystem to identify the mitigating cybersecurity capabilities, including identity, credential, and access management, and network security that must be addressed by ANA activities, creating a catalog of federal security guidance that includes RMF, uh, NIST Cybersecurity Framework, and FedRAMP. And finally, examining the alignment between security requirements and federal security guidelines and a assessment programs. The document also details industry security specifications and includes federal security guidance documents as well as relevant methodologies to conduct cybersecurity assessments of 5G systems. It identifies potential gaps in existing security guidance for from some new 5G features and services and notes additional threats may be identified at such may be identified by entities such as 3GPP, the European Telecommunications Standard Institute. And finally, for SISA, they are seeking public feedback on the Trusted Internet Connections 3.0 draft, uh, cloud, I'm sorry, cloud use case draft. The use case covers infrastructure, platform, and software as a service offerings, as well as email as a service deployments. As with previous use cases offered under the third iteration of the TIC policy, that governs how federal agencies set up their networks to secure traffic and data. The cloud use case outlines security patterns, applicable capabilities, and tele telemetry requirements. Public comments must be received by July 22nd, after which SISA will review feedback and publish a finalized version of the guidance. The Cyberspace Solarium Commission has issued uh, its workforce development agenda for national cyber director. The document offers recommendations to the private sector, US Congress and federal government to build up the nation's cybersecurity talent pool. They are calling for measures to bolster federal hiring of cyber professionals and the report calls for the office of the national cyber director to work with the office of personnel management to revamp coding structures for cybersecurity jobs and recommends the creation of specialized human resources team found on recruiting top cyber talent. The recommendations are divided into recommendations for the national cyber director, recommendations for Congress, and recommendations for the private sector. Um, we are going to spend about a minute uh, very, very quickly going through these out of respect for the Solarium Commission and their great work. Uh, for the National Cyber Director, they recommend establishing a process for ongoing cyber workforce data collection evaluation. They recommend establishing leadership and coordination structures, reviewing and aligning cyber workforce budgets, creating a cyber workforce development strategy for the federal government, and revamping cyber hiring authorities and pay flexibilities government-wide. For Congress, they recommend amending the Federal Cybersecurity Workforce Assessment Act of 2015, increasing support for CyberCorps scholarship for service program, 
incentivizing the development of entry-level employees into mid-level career talent, striving to clarify roles and responsibilities in cyber workforce development, exercising oversight on federal cyber workforce development in each department and agency, establishing cyber ex accepted service authorities government-wide, and expanding appropriations for existing efforts in cyber workforce development. For the private sector, they recommend increasing the investment in the cyber workforce and developing shared resources. Please take a look at this report. It's great work. Moving on to the Department of Defense, the Pentagon has released their plan for responsible AI, the 47-page Responsible Artificial Intelligence Strategy and Implementation Pathway outlines the Pentagon's plan to incorporate its two-year-old ethical AI principles throughout a system design, development, and use. Each of the six tenants, Government Warfighter Trust, Product and Acquisition, Requirements Validation, the Responsible AI Ecosystem, and Workforce include lines of efforts, goals, and estimated timelines. The U.S. Navy is preparing to publish a unified cybersecurity strategy and vision statement. According to the Navy's principal cyber advisor, Chris Cleary, the mission's overriding motto will be secure, survive, and strike. Senator Angus King is pushing for a measure that would require the U.S. Cyber Command to publish two unclassified reports connected with each biennial election. The first report would focus on assessing foreign threats before an election takes place, and the second would be on a post-election assessment of voting security. The GAO is calling for better oversight and coordination for counter hypersonic development. The Mission Defense Agency continues to build components of the missile defense systems uh, and test its capabilities and plan for countering evolving threats. In fiscal year 2021, the MDA made progress but continued to fall short of its goals to for asset deliveries and testing. For example, uh, they successfully delivered many of the planned interceptors and conducted developmental and operational uh, steps cybersecurity testing for MD5 elements. However, they did not conduct any planned system level cybersecurity tests, which left them without knowledge of its system's vulnerabilities and contribute to problematic delays. The shortfalls to planned system level tests were partially attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic. MDA's efforts to address hypersonic threats include the glide phase interceptor and hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensor. These efforts represent technology that have been considerable, that have considerable risks, but the GAO uh, concluded that the MDA had not taken necessary steps to reduce those risks and ensure appropriate oversight from the DOD or stakeholder involvement. Halfway through, the GAO found that the DOD needed to improve performance reporting and cybersecurity and supply chain planning. Um, they found that of the 25 DOD major IT programs under review, only 15 of those programs had department-approved cybersecurity strategy, and just 10 hadn't submitted a system security plan for information communication technology supply chain risk management. The GAO also found that most of the DOD's major IT business programs experienced cost or schedule changes between fiscal year 2020 and 2022, which ranged from 100,000 to nearly 11 billion. The GAO recommended the Defense Secretary have it, the CIO make sure business programs report operational performances as part of the DOD's submission to the Federal IT Dashboard and that major IT business programs develop approved cybersecurity strategies and plans to address supply chain risk management. Relevant to many of our audience, uh, the DOD has recently announced, uh, or implied at least, an updated timeline for CMMC implementation. During a recent CMMC Day conference, uh, it was revealed that they expect to complete documentation to submit to the OMB for the rulemaking process uh, by July of 2022, so now this month, and they expect to issue interim final rules by March of 2023. 
if they could achieve that timeline, the CMMC requirements could begin peering and solicitations as early as May of 2023, which is 60 days after publish. And the DOD also announces plans to roll out CMMC requirements in solicitations under a phased approach. Uh, in particular for phase one, when the CMMC requirements first start appearing in solicitations, all offerers will be required to conduct a self-assessment rather than a third party certification and provide a positive affirmation of compliance. Then in phase two, with timing still to be determined, solicitations will require either self-assessments or third party certifications, depending on the type of CUI and required certification level. The DOE has unveiled its National Cyber Informed Engineering Strategy, which is a bipartisan plan to strengthen the energy sector's ability to withstand a cyber attack, looks to include incorporate more cyber resilience during the manufacturing, developing, and deployment of computer systems used by energy providers. It provides a framework for enhancing engineering training tools and practices to build a resilient clean energy systems designed to withstand cyber attacks. The strategy encourages the incorporation of cybersecurity technologies early in the design lifecycle of engineered systems to reduce risk and vulnerabilities, including threats by foreign actors. Securing a strong, reliable, clean energy grid is a key component of achieving President Biden's goal of net zero carbon economy by 2050. The CIE strategy aims to incorporate cybersecurity safeguards into system electronics early that are designed to withstand sophisticated attacks and to instill better cyber resilience at the academic level so educators can develop workers with the skills required to become cyber aware. The strategy is organized into five pillars, which are awareness, education, development, current infrastructure, and future infrastructure. It seeks to reduce or eliminate cyber vulnerabilities by engineering them out from the beginning of the developmental life cycle. It also focuses on reducing the likelihood of disruptions to the nation's critical energy infrastructure, even if a cyber attack were successful. The GAO is urging the Department of Energy to adopt a comprehensive approach to electric grid resilience. Uh, they have determined that the DOE should develop a comprehensive approach um, that coordinates disaster response and grid recovery, as well as utilizes lessons learned from prior natural disasters. Their report examined 15 of 35 natural disasters that it said affected the electric grid and found that there was also inadequate coordination between emergency response and grid recovery offices around the department. Among the offices that require greater coordination include emergency uh, emergency response offices and the agencies. Office of Cybersecurity Energy, Cybersecurity, Energy Security and Emergency Response, or CESER, the Grid Recovery Support, Technical Assistance and Emergency Response Teams in the Agency's Office of Electricity, and the Technical Assistance Programs and Emergency Response Teams in the Office of Energy Efficient and Renewable Energy. The DOE has released an energy management control systems RFI on R&D opportunities uh, through their building technologies office. The RFI is to inform the BTO's strategic direction and future investments in technology research and development on energy management control systems. The RFI solicits feedback from various stakeholders on identified R&D opportunities related to the hardware, software, cybersecurity, and interoperability of energy management control systems. Responses will also inform future planning and strategic adjustments to the office's R&D portfolio. Uh, responses to this RFI must be submitted electronically. Um, we specify the email in the individual members' reports, but you can also find it on their website. And those responses are due by 5 p.m. Eastern on Monday, July 18th. DHS has launched their cybersecurity talent management system. The goal of the CTMS is to modernize the hiring of cybersecurity professionals for mission critical roles at the DHS's office of the CIO and, cyber, and CISA. The new CTMS includes different specializations known as technical capabilities, including cybersecurity policy, cybersecurity program management, cybersecurity architecture, cybersecurity data science, cybersecurity 
defense operations, cybersecurity engineering, cybersecurity research and development, cybersecurity risk management and compliance, cybersecurity threat analysis, digital forensics, mitigation and response, physical embedded and control system security, secure network operations, secure systems operations and maintenance, and vulnerability assessment. Although the initial launch of the CTMS is focused on CISA and the DHS CIO, it will be expanded to other DHS components in, later in 2022. The CTMS promises a new streamlined hiring process, new competitive compensation structures, and new meaningful career development opportunities, according to their website. And they have a couple of more detailed bullets beneath each of those that you can find either on the website or in the individual members' reports. The GAO is recommending that DHS and Treasury assess federal response to cyber attacks. Um, you may have seen this recently in the news with this focus on whether or not cyber insurance is effective. Um, it has sparked a little bit of a, a discussion online. Uh, but the report itself um, tasks SISA and Treasury with assessing whether the risk to critical infrastructure and potential financial exposures from catastrophic cyber incidents warrants a federal insurance response and to inform Congress of the results of their assessment. Uh, we have a pretty extensive write-up of this um, that you can read more about in the member's report. The FBI is la launching their National Capital Region Cybersecurity Awareness Campaign uh, to warn government and private sector organizations in the capital National Capital Region about increased cyber threats. Um, normally, we do not include uh, regional agency news, but um, this is a pretty promising effort, uh, and it's directly focused on the capital. Uh, the FBI encourages organizations of all size to partner with their local FBI office before a cyber incident occurs. Um, this educational campaign will run from June to September of 2022, and it will include media engagements, a social media campaign, and presentations to local industry groups. Um, the cyber threats being discussed include critical infrastructure attacks, ransomware, and supply chain attacks. Um, the FBI is again stressing their warning from earlier this year uh, of ransomware attacks targeting agriculture. Um, they are warning companies to reevaluate their cybersecurity as soon as possible or risk ransomware attacks that could cripple their businesses or disrupt the food supply chain during critical growing seasons. The FCC uh, is collaborating with tech stakeholders to hear their recommendations on internet security. Uh, in March, the FCC issued a notice of inquiry seeking information about vulnerabilities related to the Border Gateway Protocol, one of the foundational standards that routes data across the internet. Comments were due by April 11th, and replies uh, to comments were, were due by May 10th. The docket contains substantive comments from an array of internet economy participants that suggest that the FCC should go slow in regulatory activity, uh, letting promise work continue to expand. About 40 organizations and several individuals submitted comments um, focused on industry practices and significant interest in securing routing in academia and standards bodies. Um, those that responded included everyone from major ISPs to researchers to security companies uh, to the tech sector. The FDIC is urging all financial institutions supervised under their purview to let, agency, let the agency know of any plans to provide services related to cryptocurrencies. Uh, they issued a letter in early April uh, and they are stressing that crypto risk consideration, um, crypto risk and such considerations uh, could pose a safety risk to the soundness of the banking system, financial stability, consumer protections, and have legal implications.
DFTC is offering guidance on their safeguards rule. Um, ICIT fellow Kirk J. Nara of Wilmer Hale actually had an excellent blog post on this topic that I encourage our audience to take a look at. Um, as a brief excerpt, uh, the FTC released a publication aimed at offering financial institutions and their service providers guidance on the recently revised safeguard rules under the Graham Leach Wiley Act. The new publication, FTC Safeguard Rules, What Your Business Needs to Know, signals their continued interest in regulating the data security posture of financial institutions subject to the GLBA. Uh, as an overview, the publication notes that a reasonable information security program must include nine elements, such as a qualified individual response for the security program, periodic risk assessments, safeguards to control the risks identified through risk assessments, monitoring and testing effectiveness of safeguards on a regular basis, training staff regularly on cybersecurity awareness, service provider oversight, keeping information security programs current to safeguard against emerging threats, creating a written incident response plan, and annual reports to the boards of governors on their security program. The GAO has agreed to study the right to repair issue, uh, specifically in the automotive space, as it applies to uh, light duty vehicles within the next six months. The study comes at the request of U.S. Representative Jan Schakowsky, who is the chairwoman of the Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee, uh, who said that federal agencies need guidance on how to balance wider access to data with cybersecurity concerns. Um, right to repair is a uh, large topic in the privacy space. It's a large topic uh, in the global community and in the United States, um, depending on how in-depth uh, GAO weighs in on this, it could have implications across a number of sectors. The GAO has recommended that HHS improve their healthcare breach reporting system. Um, specifically, they would like improvements on how it collects feedback from the healthcare sector on cybersecurity breach reporting requirements. Uh, they recommend that the Office of Civil Rights set up a process to assess the ease with which entities like health plans and healthcare providers can disclose potential cybersecurity incidents to the federal government. HHS published uh, HHS's Health Sector Cybersecurity Coordination Sector has published, or HC3 has published guidance for healthcare organizations to help them improve their cyber posture. The detailed steps in the publication can be taken to improve cyber posture, such as conducting regular security posture assessments consistently monitoring networks and software for vulnerabilities, defining which departments own risk and assigning managers to specific tasks, to managers to specific risks, regularly analyzing gaps in security controls, defining key security metrics and creating incident response and disaster recovery plans. The GAO has asserted that the Department of Justice needs to improve its cybersecurity coordination with other federal agencies. The latest report counts uh, the following recommendations to the GAO, recommendations to the DOJ by the GAO. Um, but it does note uh, some growth from their 2021 report, such as establishing a criminal justice information services policy modernization task force um, within the FBI. They also recommend that the FBI director collaborate with OMB to solicit input from several federal agencies and state agency stakeholders on revisions to its security policy to ensure that cybersecurity requirements for state agencies are consistent with what other federal agencies in this guidance to the extent possible. Additionally, GAO recommends that F the FBI director revise uh, their assessment policies to maximize coordination with other agencies to the greatest extent practicable. Um, specifically, 
they would like the FBI to assess the input it has received from other agencies and determine what changes it can make to its assessment policies and procedures to enhance coordination. I believe the DOJ has slightly pushed back on this assertion. Moving on to NIST. Um, NIST has released new Mac OS security guidance for organizations. The final version of their guidance on securing Mac OS endpoints and assessing their security uh, is meant to be used by government agencies and private organizations with the provided security baselines either mapped to existing guidance or controls or customized to meet specific needs. The content can be used for automated security compliance scans and will introduce, they will also introduce the M SCP to broader audiences by offering overview of the project and its components and by providing details on common use cases. NIST, the NIST Cybersecurity for the Internet of Things program has released two documents. The first uh, entitled a discussion essay uh, the first discussion I say, which is entitled Ideas for the Future of IoT Cybersecurity at NIST, IoT Risk Identification Complexity, um, presents uh, some grounding for risk identification in IoT based on NIST's prior work in cybersecurity for IoT, such as uh, NIST IR 8259, and plots the path for forward-looking discussions on how to identify and address risks for IoT devices. The second publication, entitled A Profile on the IoT Core Baseline for Consumer IoT Products, or NIST IR 8425, uh, takes the consumer IoT cybersecurity criteria from their February 2022 white paper uh, on recommended criteria for cybersecurity labeling for consumer Internet of Things products and incorporates it into the family of NIST IoT cybersecurity guidance. NIST uh, has announced that they plan to hold an additional workshop and draft and release an additional draft prior to the final release of the Cybersecurity Framework 2.0. Um, they have been seeking feedback on the use and implementation, uh, use and improvements for the cybersecurity resources through RFIs uh, on evaluating and improving the NIST cybersecurity resources, the cybersecurity framework, and cybersecurity supply chain risk management. Uh, in the RFI, NIST asked about evaluating and improving the CSF, um, use of the framework in conjunction with other resources, and improving supply chain risk management. They garnered 134 comments, which will drive multiple efforts at NIST, such as cybersecurity risk management, supply chain cybersecurity, cybersecurity metrics, privacy, and emerging technologies. The comments will inform improvements to the CFS, as well as guide uh, their efforts under the National Initiative for Improving Cybersecurity and Supply Chain. Several RFI comments uh, provide substantive and helpful feedback to the CSF and confirm that NIST should proceed to develop the 2.0 version. NIST is seeking comments on the final SP800-160 draft guidance. Um, they published the final version of guidance on engineering trustworthy secure systems which they say will provide engineers across government and private enterprise with uh, essential de design principles. The document set out specific uh, definitions for cybersecurity leaders to follow as they implement strategies to protect their organizations, including what constitutes an adequately secured system, what constitutes loss and loss control, and what makes up digital asset management. The new guidance also clarifies terminology used in previous versions and improves references for international standards. NIST is seeking comments from industry on the final draft by July 8th, which is about a week from today. NIST is also seeking public comments on the initial volume draft guidance um, for their Zero Trust Architecture Implementation Guide. The preliminary draft details how the NCCOE and its collaborators use commercial and open source technology to develop a set of implementations that will align with this zero trust architecture framework. Comments are due by July 5th, which is next Tuesday.
OMB and the GSA have announced that the technology modernization fund will designate 100 million to improve customer experiences with the with the federal government. The funding will support innovative technology projects focused on reducing burdens on the American public and the federal workers who serve them. Funds will be designated to help streamline and improve digital services to deliver better customer experience to the American people. The 100 million is a portion of the 1 billion in allocated in the American Rescue Plan funding previously provided by Congress to help secure and modernize government technology after the pandemic accelerated the need to improve online access to government services for the public. Uh, at the time of this recording, the Technology Modernization Fund has invested nearly 400 million of the 1 billion allocation um, in funding for 12 projects. Moving on, the SEC, uh, Security Exchange Commission, is proposing that companies disclose material cybersecurity incidents within four days. But business groups are pushing back on that plan, citing their own interests in confidentiality and potential conflicts posed by increasing complexity web of cybersecurity law and regulation from the federal government. The groups caution that companies could be putting themselves at risk by making breach disclosures within the time frame ordered under the SEC rules. Uh, the public letter stated that, quote, detailed public disclosures could give cyber criminals and state-based hackers a trove of data to further victimize companies, harm law enforcement investigators, and disrupt public private responses to cyber attacks. Uh, also, the cost of rulemaking outweighs its benefits to investors. Again, that is a direct quote from the letter submitted to the SEC. The U.S. State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research has released a cybersecurity strategy focused on technical debt. Um, the strategy aims to cultivate a more proactive approach to vulnerability detection and remediation. Uh, the stated stra strategy goals of the INR um, publication include establishing effective governance to manage cyber risk, modernizing and automating security capabilities, technologies, and IT infrastructure, improving engagement with intelligence community stakeholders, and developing, managing, and maintaining experienced cybersecurity workforce. You can read more about this in greater depth in our report or in the publication. The Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, uh, or FinCEN, issued a proposal on no action letter process for anti-money laundering compliance. They are seeking public comment on the proposal to provide regulatory relief by implementing um, the no letter process at the agency. Uh, in particular, they are soliciting public comment on how the proposed new process would overlap or interact with those other forms of governance and relief already available. Moving on, the Transportation Security Administration announced changes to a cybersecurity directive for U.S. pipelines after backlash from industry and trade groups. Um, TSA issued two sets of security directives last year after the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline. Um, in May 2022, the TSA reissued the first set of security directives for critical pipelines after they had expired. The first set of rules forced owners and operators of critical pipelines to report cybersecurity incidents designated designate a cybersecurity coordinator and conduct vulnerability assessments. The reissued security directive changed the incident reporting timeline from 12 to 24 hours. The second directive was developed in July of 2021 in collaboration with SISA and required owners to implement specific mitigation measures to protect against ransomware attacks and other threats uh, to information technology and operational technology, develop and implement a cybersecurity contingency recovery plan, and conduct a cybersecurity architecture design review. The second set of rules faced significant backlash from industry cybersecurity stakeholders and companies who said that the rules were overly prescriptive and actually damaged efforts to improve pipeline security. 
As a result, the agency is planning to reissue the second set of security guidelines next month, but with changes that afford greater flexibility to industry in achieving critical cybersecurity outcomes. The new version of the directive will move to a performance-based model that will enhance security and provide flexibility needed to ensure cybersecurity advances with improvements in technology. TSA also intends to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking within next year that if issued as a final rule would for the first time permanently codify a number of critical cybersecurity requirements for pipelines and other surface transportation systems. A spokesperson said, quote, this action could protect critical transportation infrastructure from continually evolving and increasingly sophisticated cyber threats and better safeguard our nation and economy secured. And finally, for this month, we have two updates from the White House. Um, the White House included cybersecurity in their joint declaration between state, Spain and the US this week. Uh, the joint declaration of mutual understandings the White House released following President Biden's visit to Spain included a provision on intensifying collaboration on justice and security issues, which stated the United States and Spain intend to maintain build, and build upon their strong law enforcement cooperation, including with respect to extra tradition and mutual legal assistance. They plan to reinforce their collaboration in fights against terrorism, cybercrime, drug trafficking, and trafficking of persons. They intend to strengthen cybersecurity cooperation to increase national resilience to cyber attacks, promote responsible state behavior in cyberspace, and counter malicious cyber activity from nation states and criminal actors. And finally, this month for our agency updates, the White House uh, issued their memorandum on the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. President Biden and G7 leaders formally launched the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment uh, this month, and the PGII will develop game, is, is expected to develop game-changing projects to close the infrastructure gap in developing countries, strengthen the global economy and supply chains, and advance U.S. national security. President Biden's memorandum calls for greater spending and focus on critical infrastructure, including on areas like cybersecurity and critical infrastructure resiliency. The U.S. aims to mobilize around $200 billion for PGII over the next five years uh, through federal grants, federal financing, and leveraging private sector investments. An additional $400 billion is expected from the other G7 partners by 2027. The funds will be focused on global infrastructure investments, and additional capital is expected from like-minded partners, multilateral development banks, development finance institutions, and sovereign wealth funds and other sources. The four pillars established by the PGII were tackling the climate crisis and bolstering global energy security through investments in climate resilient infrastructure, transformative energy technologies, and developing clean energy supply chains across the fully full integrated life cycle from the responsible mining of metals and critical minerals to low emissions transportation and hard infrastructure to investing in new global refining, processing, and battery manufacturing sites to deploying proven as well as innovative scalable technologies in place of those that do not yet have clean energy. I apologize, each of these pillars is going to be a little bit long. Uh, developing Pillar 2 is developing, expanding, and deploying secure information and communications technology, networks, and infrastructure to power economic growth and facilitate open digital societies from working with trusted vendors to provide 5G and 6G digital connectivity to supporting access to platforms and services that depend upon open, interoperable, secure, and reliable internet and mobile networks with sound cybersecurity. Pillar 3 is advancing gender equity and equality from care infrastructure that increases opportunities for economic participation by women to improve water and sanitation infrastructure that addresses gender gaps in unpaid work and time use in order to boost the global economic recovery by ensuring that half the population is not forced uh, out of the decision-making process. And pillar four is developing and upgrading the infrastructures of health systems and contributing global health security through investments in patient-centered health services and health workforce vaccine and other essential medical product manufacturing, disease surveillance and early warning systems, including safe and secure labs and addressing the current pandemic and preventing and preparing for the next one, which is crucial to the US economic and national security. 
If you are still with me through all 52 of those agency updates, we're going to move on to this month's legislation. We are currently in the 117th session of Congress, which runs until January 3rd of next year, and there are currently 14,926 bills introduced to the Congress, of which traditionally around 7% would become law. At the moment, there are 397 cybersecurity bills introduced, but that includes um, resolutions and reintroductions of bills. These bills account for around 2.6% of the total bills introduced. At the time of this recording, 53 cybersecurity bills have been enacted under the current congressional session, uh, which accounts for around 13.4% of cybersecurity bills introduced in that session. Uh, or around 10.7% of all of the bills signed into law. So cybersecurity does have a higher rate um, of enactment than other legislation at the moment. Uh, ac actually, though, at the moment, uh, Congress is enacting legislation at a rate of around 3.3%. As I mentioned previously, the 397 number counts resolutions and reintroductions of bills, uh, different versions, things like that. So ICIT has um, parsed through that, and we are currently tracking 247 unique pieces of legislation relating to critical infrastructure technology and cybersecurity, which accounts for around 1.65% of the bills before Congress. We have 19 bills uh, this month, of which um, 13 are newly introduced and six are updated bills from prior uh, months. Nine of those bills originated in the Senate and the other 10 originated in the House. As you can see on the part on your left, the most prevalent topic for legislation this month was the cyber workforce, uh, which was also a recurring topic in the agency initiatives. Jumping right on in, we have H.R. 8237, which makes appropriations for the legislative branch for the fiscal year ending September 30th of 2023. In particular, relating to cybersecurity, Section 112 charges the head of any federal entity that provides assistance to the House of Representatives in the House's efforts to deter, prevent, mitigate, or remediate cybersecurity risks and incidents involving the information system of the House to take all necessary steps to ensure that constitutional integrity of the separate branches of government at all stages of providing the assistance, including applying minimization procedures to limit the spread or sharing of privileged house and member information. Section 208 prohibits reliance on Huawei or ZTE infrastructure and clause three tasks the FBI with conducting risk assessments against telecommunication systems and equipment originating from or subsidized by the People's Republic of China, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea or the Russian Federation. Moving on to cyber workforce, S1097 establishes a federal rotational uh, workforce program to improve the resiliency of agencies and the cybersecurity capabilities of federal personnel. Uh, this was introduced in, back in April of 2021. Uh, we updated on it, I believe, last month, and it was signed into law this month. Uh, similarly, in terms of enactment, uh, HR 1154 and S Res 680 designates June designated June as National Cybersecurity Education Month. Uh, through the resolution, the House and Senate invite individuals and organizations in the U.S. to recognize the essential role of cybersecurity educators and support federal, state, and local education efforts. Uh, it also encouraged education and training institutions to increase the understanding and awareness of cybersecurity education at the institutions and promote public guidance and initiatives from NIST and other agencies. Finally, it committed Congress to raise awareness about cybersecurity education and enact legislation in support of cybersecurity education to effectively build and sustain a skilled workforce. HR 8215 and S4493 improve cybersecurity practices and improve digital literacy among veterans. Um, these bills are still in the preliminary stage and ICIT will have additional information as they progress. For HR 
for election uh, reform and election security this month, we have HR 7992, which establishes the De Democracy Advancement and Innovation Program, th whose activities include promoting innovation to improve efficiency and smooth functioning in the administration of elections for federal office and to secure the infrastructure used in the administration of such elections, including making upgrades to voting equipment and registration systems, voter registration and nonpartisan voter outreach activities, secure voting locations, expanding polling places, and the availability of early and mail voting and promoting cybersecurity. Uh, recruiting, training, and retaining nonpartisan election officials and poll workers to protect election and, and to protect election officials, um, both nonpartisan and those elected are appointed to their position from threats of violence, and increasing access to voting in elections for federal office in underserved communities uh, for individuals with disabilities, against uh, or for uh, racial and language minority groups for individuals entitled to vote by absentee ballot under the Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act and for voters residing in um, native lands. We have no updates this month in the energy sector. With regards to the federal government, S-2520 amends the Homeland Security Act of 2002 to provide for engagements with state, local, and tribal and territorial governments related to cybersecurity and infrastructure security under the Act and any provision of law, including grants, cooperative agreements, and contracts that provide assistance and education related to cyber threat indicators, defensive measures, and cybersecurity technologies, cybersecurity risks, incidents, analysis, and warnings. S4357 reauthorizes the Maritime Administration and Section 51325 amends Chapter 513 of Title 46, United States Code, to establish a sexual assault and sexual harassment prevention information management system. The bill calls for the Office of Inspector General of the Department of Transportation to conduct a cybersecurity audit of the system and submit a report containing the results to the Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation of the Senate and the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure of the House within 90 days of the establishment of the system. With regards to the financial sector, HR 8000 provides incentives for states to fully to, to recover fraudulently paid federal and state unemployment compensation that may have been issued during the COVID-19 pandemic to criminal organizations, including international cyber crime ranks and opportunistic foreign threat actors uh, who exploited a national crisis to steal alleged billions from American taxpayers. Fraud delayed legitimate payments to unemployed workers and turned thousands of Americans uh, into the victims of identity theft. The Labor Department's Office of the Inspector General estimates that at least $163 billion of the $872.5 billion in federal state unemployment benefits paid during the pandemic may have been improperly paid with a significant portion attributed to fraud. Uh, meanwhile, the White House estimated that 18.71% uh, an 18.71% improper payment rate in the federal state unemployment insurance program during fiscal year 2021. S4356 provides for the responsible financial innovation that brings digital assets within the regulatory perimeter. In particular, Section 303 requires the SEC to issue guidance within 180 days of enactment relating to Section 240.15C33 of Title 17, Code of Federal Regulations, or any successive regulation providing that the requirement to designate a satisfactory control location for a digital asset that is or may represent ownership of a security may be satisfied by protecting the digital asset through commercially reasonable cybersecurity practices to maintain control of a sufficient private key material to transfer control of the digital asset to another person or to cause another person to obtain control of the digital asset, including by means of smart contract that generates private key material without the involvement of a neutral party. Section 805 requires the Secretary of the Treasury in consultation with the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, Securities and Exchange Commission, and private sector developers and participants 
in decentralized protocols, digital assets, and digital asset exchanges to analyze the market position of decentralized financial technologies with respect to digital assets and submit to Congress, to submit to the Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs and the Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry in the Senate and the Committee on Financial Services and Committee on Agriculture in the House of Representatives to report on the current development and use of decentralized financial protocols in the U.S., opportunities, benefits, and challenges relating to decentralized financial protocols, a comparison of operational friction, fees, liquidity, and trading opportunities in decentralized financial protocols, digital asset markets, and traditional markets, transparency, prevention, and manipulation, of, and customer protections, cybersecurity and resiliency, uh, and ensuring the accuracy and information regarding the underlying smart contracts of decentralized financial protocols and the transactions facilitated by contracts as the information appears on a website or similar means relating to that protocol. Section 808 focuses on the cybersecurity standards for digital asset intermediaries. Uh, and you can read about that in greater depth in the write-up. Section 4428 supports the security of Taiwan and its right to self-determination, in part by recognizing Taiwan as an essential cybersecurity partner in the region that is targeted by an estimated 20 million cyber attacks uh, attributed to China per month. Section 204 tasks the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense with developing a report to submit to, to appropriate congressional committees on matters including an assessment of Taiwan's efforts to enhance cybersecurity. The bill also defines influence operations and sharp power campaigns against Taiwan. And Section 807 authorizes the president to impose sanctions on any foreign person determined to be engaged in malicious cyber activities, influence operations uh, geared towards destabilization, or military exercises that cross the middle line in the Taiwan Strait on behalf of the government of the People's Republic of China. Moving on to HR 8152, uh, the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, which provides consumers with foundational data privacy rights, creates a strong oversight mechanism, establishes, and establishes meaningful enforcement. If the bill becomes law, it would provide a national standard on what data companies can gather from individuals and how they can use that data. Um, this would be a huge step for the privacy community. Um, the initial draft includes bipartisan agreements, uh, on issues such as whether a federal privacy law can preempt state laws and whether individuals should have the right to sue companies that illegally share their data or use it in ways that the law prohibits. Um, the goals of the bill are to provide a comprehensive data privacy framework, to end discriminatory use of consumer data, to hold companies to high standards of data security and minimization, and to prohibit pay for privacy practices. The compromises included in the bill are an agreement that the federal law will prohibit state laws by default, with exemptions for California and Illinois in particular, as well as broad classes of state laws, certain limited rights for individuals to sue for monetary damages if a company violates their privacy. Uh, this is a setup referred to as privacy right of action, requirements that groups gathering data minimize what they collect, provisions that restrict covered entities from collecting, processing, and transferring covered data beyond what is reasonably necessary, proportionate, and limited to provide specific products and services, prohibiting the transfer of sensitive data to third parties without express affirmative consent on the individuals to whom it pertains, mandating a large data holders that use algorithms to assess their algorithms annually and submit annual uh, algorithmic impact assessments to the FTC, to increase transparency, uh, and an increase in online data privacy protections for children under the age of 17 and a ban on targeted advertising to children under the age of 17. Moving on to public health, H.R. 7667 amends the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to revise and extend their user fee programs for prescription drugs, medical devices, generic drugs, and biosimilar biological processes. Section 808 focuses on ensuring the cybersecurity of medical devices, um, and it amends the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to ensure cybersecurity throughout the life cycle of a device by requiring any person who submits a pre-market submission to include 
security information necessary to verify that it meets cybersecurity requirements deemed appropriate to demonstrate a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness, including uh, minimum requirements such as uh, the manufacturer having a plan to appropriately modify, identify, and address in a reasonable time post-market cybersecurity vulnerabilities and exploits, um, the manufacturer design, developing, and maintaining processes and procedures to ensure the device and related systems are secure, uh, the manufacturer providing in the label of the device a software bill of materials, including commercial open source and off-the-shelf software components, and the manufacturer complying with other requirements the secretary may require to demonstrate a reasonable assurance of the safety and effectiveness of the product for the purpose of cybersecurity. S4336 uh, requires the Secretary of HHS in consultation with the Director of CISA to annually review as appropriate uh, and update guidance for industry and Food and Drug Administration staff in medical device cybersecurity. Um, It also calls for the FDA to share information publicly about federal resources for healthcare professionals, medical device manufacturers, and health systems that will help them identify and assess vulnerabilities and to ensure that they can access appropriate support. Finally, it requires the GAO to compile a report on cybersecurity vulnerabilities affecting medical devices and make recommendations to improving federal coordination to support cybersecurity medical for medical devices. And finally, for this month, we have three bills in the technology category. S516 plans for and coordinates efforts to integrate advanced air mobility aircraft into the national airspace system. The bill establishes a working group uh, consisting of the FAA, DOT, NASA, DOC, DOD, DOE, DHS, FCC, USDA, Department of Labor, and other departments. The group is tasked with planning for and coordinating efforts related to the safety, infrastructure, physical security, and cybersecurity, and federal investment necessary for the maturation of AAM ecosystem, particularly passenger carrying aircraft in the United States. You can read more about this in the, uh, the individual members report or the piece of legislation. HR 6270 directs the Secretary of Transportation to establish a pilot program to provide grants related to advanced air mobility infrastructure. One of the requirements of comprehensive plans submitted include the identification of physical and digital infrastructure required to meet the standards for vertiport design and performance characteristics established by the FAA including modifications to existing infrastructure and ground sensors, electrical charging and other fueling components, electric utility requirements, wireless and cybersecurity requirements, and other necessary hardware and software. And finally this month, H.R. 8065 authorizes the development of the National Strategy for the Research and Development of Distributed Ledger Technologies and their applications authorize awards to support research on distributed ledger technologies and their applications and authorizes an applied research project on distributed ledger technologies in commerce. Section 4 authorizes the director of the National Science Foundation to make awards on a competitive basis to institutions of higher education, including minority serving institutions or nonprofit organizations to support research, including interdisciplinary research on distributed ledger technologies, their applications and other issues that impact or are causing any by distributed ledger technologies. Uh, research may be on topics such as the, uh, bear with me on this, the implications on trust, transparency, privacy, accessibility, accountability, and energy consumption by different consensus mechanisms and hardware choices and approaches for addressing these implications. Uh, number two is the uh, approaches for improving the security, privacy, resiliency, interoperability, performance, and scalability of distributed ledger technologies and their applications which may include decentralized networks. Three is approaches for identifying and addressing vulnerabilities and improving the performance and expressive power of smart contracts. Four is the implication of quantum computing on application of distributed ledger technology, including long-term protection of sensitive information and techniques to address them. Five is game theory mechanism design and economics underpinning that facilitating the operations and governance of decentralized networks enabled by distributed ledger technologies. Six is social behavior participants in decentralized networks enabled by distributed ledger technologies. Seven is human such design approaches to make distributed ledger technologies and their applications more usable and accessible. 
and eight is use cases for distributed ledger technologies across a variety of sectors and government. Nine is the social behavioral and economic implications associated with the growth of applications of digital ledger technology, including decentralized and business, financial, and economic systems. And finally, this month, uh, we have HR 777 which amends the Homeland Security Act 2002 to authorize SISA to establish an industrial control system cybersecurity training initiative. This concludes the June 2022 ICIT Cyber Legislation and Federal Agency Initiatives webcast. Uh, thank you for sticking with me through that. If you would like more information on any of the, uh, the, the initiatives or legislation discussed today, please uh, take a look at our individual members' reports or sign up to become an individual member. Have a great holiday weekend.